Don't hear anything. Which? Oh, yes. That's the first question. So, do you want to make eye contact with your spirit? Up and down. For the members right now, participants. Yes. Enthusiastic. Phone off, it's like a call. No, no, no. Good afternoon. Uh, I am delighted to welcome you uh, to the first of our lectures uh, this academic year on COVID-19. The COVID-19 pandemic is an unprecedented event in our lifetime. And the extent to which it is it has permeated our everyday lives forces us to experience the everyday ethics of contagion. With 7 million cases and over 200,000 deaths in the United States as of now, the COVID-19 pandemic uh, has been the worst pandemic since the 1918 flu. The, uh, the, the, the pervasive and disruptive nature of this pandemic has forced us both as individuals and as a country to reconsider our social interactions and behaviors, the limits of our medical response and, and that of the healthcare system, and even our relationships with each other, as well as with our local and global communities. In many ways, the pandemic has been a real world stress test of basic principles and practices uh, of clinical and public health ethics, compelling all of us to re-examine how these ethical fields can and should inform policies that guide clinical practice and social behaviors. This lecture series will examine a broad range of important ethical topics that have far reaching impact for the medical, social, and political aspects of the COVID-19 pandemic. The lecture series consists of 27 lectures on Wednesdays, beginning today, October 7, and concluding on Wednesday, May 12 of 2021, with about three, three weeks off uh, around Christmas and New Year's time. Uh, as this lecture series unfolds within the, within the context of the ongoing pandemic, we hope to address critical questions and uh, concerns of the current moment 
by drawing upon the past and looking ahead to an uncertain future. Some of the issues that we'll focus on closely in these lectures include COVID-19's association with healthcare disparities, COVID-19's impact on ethically appropriate allocation and triage in the face of scarce resources, the focus on the challenges of developing a COVID-19 safe and effective vaccine, and even the work of the World Health Organization in dealing with COVID-19 as an international pandemic. The McLean Center for Clinical Medical Ethics and the Buxbaum Institute for Clinical Excellence have organized this lecture series, and the principal developers of the series have, are Brian Callender, Marshall Chin, Lainey Ross, myself, along with Peter Angelos, Albert Wang, Emily Landon, Will Parker, and Monica Peek. I'm now honored to introduce our speaker today, the opening speaker of the 27 lecture series, Dr. Emily Landon, who's been a major leader in addressing the management and ethics of the COVID-19 pandemic. Emily Landon is an MD, is Associate Professor of Medicine in the sections of Infectious Diseases and Global Health and is a faculty member at the McLean Center here at the university. Dr. Landon is also the University of Chicago's hospital epidemiologist and serves as the medical director of the infection control program and the antimicrobial stewardship program. Dr. Landon completed her medical residency, chief residency and fellowship in infectious diseases here at the University of Chicago. Her research has focused on improving care, specifically reducing the risk of healthcare associated infections and optimizing antimicrobial utilization. She has studied novel electronic hand hygiene monitoring techniques and has evaluated the impact of direct individual level feedback to encourage provider actions that prevent infections. Dr. Landon has been a clear leader during this pandemic, including the speech she gave at the Illinois governor's COVID-19 press conference uh, earlier this year. Dr. Landon has also appeared and spoken both in local and national outlets, such as the Hyde Park Herald and the Chicago Tribune, the Washington Post, the WTTW station, CNN, ABC, CBS, NBC, and I could go on for quite a while. I am delighted to welcome Dr. Emily Landon uh, to present her speech today. The title of which, bear with me, is COVID-19 Ethics what the hell happened? Dr. Landon. Hi, uh, Mark. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Mark. That was a very kind introduction. I'm going to share my screen now um, so that we can all see my slides. I don't usually use slides when I'm talking about COVID uh, because I realized in uh, January that I had to change them every single day because things were changing so quickly and I got used to not using slides. But I did think that there were some important things that I wanted to illustrate today as a part of this talk, which, which I see as a little bit of sort of a, a step away from sort of the media and the instructions and the uh, sort of most recent thing that came out that needs to be explained. And instead, an opportunity to reflect a little bit on how this pandemic has shaped who we are and what it means to us and um, talk a little bit about how this, this whole uh, year's worth of a, a series of lectures will be important. I have no disclosures related to this talk. 
I, everyone knows the, the world is not the same as it was before. Um, we are all different. We, we don't really know what that says about us or what it means for us, nor do we know exactly how the world is going to be tomorrow or next week or next month. And comparing it to how it was last month doesn't make any sense. Um, a lot of the questions that we've been asking ourselves are not new. Questions about the ethics, about how to distribute scarce resources and any other things that Mark was talking about, but they are in a very different context here, a much more quick moving context that has changed the way we do things. See, um, we talk a lot about the beneficence, autonomy, non-maleficence and justice or the four box method, Mark's four box method, when we're talking about ethics in medicine. And in that job, we often strive to try and minimize the contextual features of the situation or the community effects. We try to focus mostly on the patient in front of us. But in a pandemic, everything changes and justice or the surrounding situation or the community or the effect on other individuals becomes central to everything that we choose to do or choose not to do. And in this world of self-preservation, personalized medicine and individuality, it's quite a shock when we need to sacrifice and change everything from our leisure activities to our professional practice in order to reorient ourselves around the demands made by an invisible, transmissible illness. It's not an experience that I've ever had in my lifetime and it's not one that um, many of us have had, but it's one that we're in and one that we need to face together. In this series, we're going to delve into the ethical questions that come along with having public health rules about masks and protective equipment and if they're where they need to be and who needs to have what, about distributing scarce resources like the new therapeutics that are being developed on the fly and tested in a very high pressure situation with a lot of political influence. The disparities aspect of this pandemic is so huge. It can't possibly be contained in a lecture series, in a year's course, in anything. It is literally shows us what the foundation of our medical care system, all of the cracks show with this disease. The testing and contact tracing and the subsequent quarantines and isolations and whether or not we have to follow them or should follow them or must test or must allow people the decision about whether or not they should get a test. These are questions that we ask every day about things like cancer treatment, but they often don't have any impact on others around them. Whereas with testing and contact tracing, with quarantine and isolation, they definitely do. This is very evident anytime you turn on the news today. There's a lot of issues around vaccine development and distribution, how we're going to, whether or not we should stop trials early, whether the cutoffs for trials are appropriate or whether they are not careful enough. There are obviously are reasons to cut corners in vaccine development when you are in the middle of a pandemic, but how much do you cut? And then how do you distribute them fairly, appropriately, safely? And so that they work optimizing their beneficence and their non-maleficence. There's also a strong issue with education and children and I would go on to say economics and public health and whether or not it's fair or right that people who are often lower income and maybe more often black or brown are more often in our essential professions or in essential jobs, putting themselves in harm's way for the rest of us. There are so many things to talk about and they will, many of them will be covered in this lecture series. But today, I think that our knowledge in about the disease itself has grown as exponentially as the spread of the disease. And it is hard for the general public to adapt to such rapid growth of understanding in a complex scientific fact that then ultimately influence their daily behavior. Needless to say, the embrace of this life or death level threat 
that surrounds that's surrounded by uncertainty has made some people's mental health crisis worse has created new mental health crises in others has left some people alone at home and others just in denial we're going to talk more about that later but first i think it's important and what i want to accomplish today is to give you the basics of the fact some information about what has happened about what we know and some notes that will help you to understand where we go from here and then i will leave plenty of time for questions because i know there will be many i'm happy to answer them Going back in time, I made this slide on January 23rd um, for our very first um, episode with, or our very first meeting with the Hicks team. And um, this was the basic information that I could put together. I've added a bit at the end. The coronavirus is a known virus. It's named for the crown that's seen on electron microscopy. And there was a cluster of cases of pneumonia in December in 2019 in Wuhan in Hubei province in China. Many of you know that we have a partnership with Wuhan University Medical School and that um, I've actually been to Wuhan many times and worked in these hospitals alongside some of these providers and are friends with many of them um, who cared for some of these patients. In our discussions with them since then, some of these dates have been, while not officially revised by the Chinese government, acknowledge that perhaps the cases were happening before December of 2019. They found a new beta coronavirus that's related to a bat coronavirus and the SARS coronavirus. So most coronaviruses that cause the normal everyday common cold are not beta coronaviruses. This is a separate family that includes some bat things, some regular SARS and some MERS and then SARS-CoV-2, which is now dominating that entire class. At the time, it was called the 2019 novel coronavirus. Now we know it's the SARS coronavirus number two. And the case fatality rate was already around 1% or less than 1%, meaning it was less deadly than SARS or MERS and remains to be the same, but is much more transmissible, as we have all seen. The infection timeline hasn't changed much. It takes about two to 12 days of an incubation period, although the majority of people get sick on day five or six or seven after an exposure. Severely ill patients who need to be in the hospital often have symptoms for upwards of a week before they come to the attention of the hospital, which means that it can be two weeks from the exposure to the time that that patient is registered in the hospital. And then what we know now is that it can take another couple of weeks before that person succumbs to their illness. But far and away, most patients don't. Most patients are able to be supported through their illness and are able to be released from the hospital. But many have long-term consequences of this illness. Some even healthy people have long-term consequences of the illness. Some people with even mild symptoms seem to have long-term consequences of their illness. And the actual longevity of these concerns and the severity of them over time is unknown because we haven't had enough time. I used to say in March and April that at that point, this disease wasn't old enough for us to know what would even happen to, with early pregnant women who had been pregnant in China because the time had not come for them to deliver their babies. We're now past that place and we now know much more that most people are actually not going to get very ill from coronavirus, including many pregnant women. But older individuals, those with cardiovascular disease, lung disease or kidney disease and men are at higher risk. It seems that those with vitamin D deficiencies or lower vitamin D often are also at greater risk. And there is more to be learned about others and why some people get sick and others stay relatively healthy. Fever and cough are often the common symptoms, but we now acknowledge that there are different sort of constellations of symptoms that some patients arrive with. Some have viral pneumonia and look exactly like they did when I made this slide, and then others have derived in the hospital with more of a GI symptom complex, and others just have a fever and achy muscles and achy joints. We know that the disease is now transmitted by droplets and sometimes aerosols, and we'll talk more about that because I know it makes a big difference. We also know now that pre-symptomatic and asymptomatic spread are common and that they dominate the problems that we see with this virus. On this slide are everything that you need to know to know that this is going to be a pandemic. 
The fact that the virus can evade being seen for six days before anyone gets sick, that it can spread before you even know that you're ill. The fact that those people can go on and be mild to moderately ill, spreading to their family with no more than a cold for six days before they ever show up in the hospital and are so sick that they are literally removed and isolated from the rest of the crowd or the community. That's what makes anything dangerous and difficult to manage. The symptoms of coronavirus have grown and we know more about it than we did then. Like I said, some people just have cough and fever. Some people have chills, muscle pain and fever. Some people have GI symptoms, which aren't even listed on this sheet. But this new loss of taste or smell is the most interesting one and one that we're often seeing. Interestingly enough, the majority, the, the main reason why we have people come to work sick with COVID is that they think that it's probably their allergies, which means that congestion, which also isn't on this sheet, Congestion, scratchy throat are really common early symptoms. Unlike influenza, which seems to sort of hit you like a truck, as they say, COVID comes on slowly without having very much or any, really, um, warning. Sort of insidious in its onset. And that asymptomatic and pre-symptomatic trend transmission is important. For every person we diagnose with COVID who has symptoms of COVID and who's tested positive, there's at least one other individual walking around with COVID who is contagious with COVID who thinks that they are completely fine. They may have such minor symptoms that they think it's just their allergies, or they may be not sick at all. Making control of the virus even more universal. So what's the difference between this airborne and this droplet precaution? Well, we use different signs for them in the hospital. And I think about this sort of thing in my team, we think about this sort of thing all the time, but you probably don't. One means you wear a surgical mask and one means you wear an N95. The reality is that there is actually a continuum between the two and many diseases can behave more airborne or more droplet at different times. In fact, influenza is a good example. It often aerosolizes itself when patients undergo aerosol generating procedures. And while you may not know this, there certainly are times when you're caring for influenza patients that you should be wearing an N95, but you may not have read the fine print on the signs. Right now, we know a lot more about COVID and it is really a much bigger problem with COVID than it is with influenza. In certain circumstances where there's more heavy breathing, where there's singing, especially the vibration makes the droplets smaller, which allows them to hang on in the air, travel longer and stay aloft and in the room lingering longer. Those two things are what we see when we see more aerosol transmission. This is distinct from full on airborne transmission like measles, where it can stay in a room for hours after you walk out of it. It's not really very common with COVID. We're not seeing that very often. Obviously, if the concentration of respiratory droplets, even the tiny ones are high enough in a room, it could linger after someone leaves. And so you can see how the continuum means that we sometimes use certain masks and other times use others. The vast majority of infections are spread by droplets to close contacts. That is the far and away truth. You need to have a perfect storm of things come together in order to create a situation where there is more of an aerosolized transmission. Even high flow nasal cannula and nebulizer treatments often don't do that. We need to have a crowded room. That means higher humidity and maybe warmer. And not very much ventilation, which none of the rooms in our hospital have. We all have very high ventilation rates in our hospital. And then we need to have someone who is making lots and lots of droplets that are infected without having a mask on. We ask people to wear N95s when they get close to that situation, but at home, the best way to stop these things from happening is by wearing a mask because source control holds in 95% of the droplets, making it much less likely that they'll ever be enough to create that kind of super spreader event. What about surfaces? I'm asked this a lot. Viral particles from COVID can sustain life on some surfaces for up to 72 hours. But it turns out that in real life, we're not seeing very many people get infected from that. In other words, you have to get more, even if you touch a surface that's contaminated, there's not enough of it there or not enough of it transferring to your hands or not enough of it getting off your hands into your mouth in order to make you infected. It seems like you probably need to get these droplets 
more into your mucous membranes earlier. So I think we need to keep surfaces clean and wash our hands, of course, but this is not the main way that COVID is transmitted. And we shouldn't be too, too overly concerned and focus too much of our efforts on preventing transmission by cleaning things instead of doing what's really necessary, which is putting masks on everyone and improving our ventilation. I'd like to talk for a moment about the current epidemiology. Now that we've covered some of the transmission in the United States, we have not done well. We have failed to address things on a national level. The state of Illinois is doing much better and I'll show you that in a moment, but this is the graph from the New York Times of the sort of new cases. And you can see that we never get back anywhere near where we were in the beginning of March when we honestly didn't have any cases because we weren't testing. Now that we're testing more frequently, we're identifying more cases, which is common, happens in every pandemic and epidemic. But you can see that the baseline is ever increasing, and that means there's more and more transmission, with increasing transmission happening over as we're moving into a time when these super spreader-like events where we have the trifecta of unmasked individuals crowded into a space with poor ventilation is going to happen much more frequently. This is another look at the map version where the cases are right now in the United States. I pulled this actually at about 11 o'clock this morning. So I think it is pretty accurate for right now from the New York Times website. Wisconsin is battling a, the pandemic in a, a significant way right now. And everyone is taking their turns having a really rough time of it. How does this happen? Why is it that it doesn't go everywhere all the time? Why is it that things have been so spotty? Why does one city get sick while another city doesn't? That's a great question. Many of us believe that this is because there are sufficient number of these kind of super spreader cluster events that begin to sort of trip off um, a cascade of additional clustering events. And, and the things that make those things happen is that we have more opportunities for large scale spread. If everyone's only spreading to one, maybe two other people, it's unlikely to be this kind of a problem. But when you have a few people that spread to 20, or 30, it can easily become a, a, a large cluster. And then the ones and twos really matter as much, just as much. Illinois has been aggressive about this from the start. And I have to say, uh, as much as I have been critical of our federal government's response in terms of getting the appropriate PPE to the right places, of getting, working hard to distribute uh, the therapeutics correctly, uh, to develop new therapeutics, I think that, uh, and to get testing into the places where we need to see more testing, we certainly are doing better in Illinois than many other places. That's because we've been aggressive about closing down places that are high risk for these clustering events, and that we've been very aggressive about putting masks into place early on, May 1st, actually, which is before much of the country. Nonetheless, we're still seeing a transmission rate in Chicago and in Illinois that is higher than what we want it to be going into the fall. The daily tests on a seven day average, the daily uh, cases on a seven day average are still in the 300s in Chicago, which is more than what we want. I'd like to see those in the 100s in Chicago or lower. You can see that the positivity rate is hovering just under 5%. We were up at 5% a few weeks ago. Now we're down at 4.3, but we seem to have had like sort of ping pong back and forth in that place, which is still far more than most European countries consider to be a serious situation. Now Chicago's done a lot about keeping bars closed. I know they've most recently opened and we can talk about that in the Q&A, but they're certainly, um, we've been doing better and we've been holding steady and especially in Hyde Park. I wanna talk now about the numbers behind the epidemiology. I'm not a big fan of complex math, but um, I do think that we should be very simply discussing what an SIR model is and how we make predictions and why does this disease behave the way that it behaves. So an, an SIR model is takes into account susceptible individuals, infectious individuals, and recovered or removed individuals, so people who are not in the model or are not susceptible and they are not infectious. 
or they are not able to spread to other people. And you can see a very, very simple model of what COVID would look like. You have a lot of susceptible people in the beginning of the pandemic. You have a lot of people get sick. Some people don't have clinical infection, but everyone catches it and you end up with having a lot of recovered or removed individuals. They no longer matter. They can't be contagious or catch the disease. And so they are out of the model. And then the disease dies out because no, you no longer have susceptible individuals. This is how most people think about a respiratory virus pandemic and how it moves through a community. COVID isn't doing this exactly for a lot of reasons. First of all, the pandemic spike would be much, much higher. There would be so many people sick that we've taken a lot of, made a lot of efforts to try and control the spread of the disease. And we're not entirely sure about how many recovered people are actually no longer susceptible to the disease which makes it all much, much more confusing. Looking at it another way, these are the boxes. You can see that there is more to the equation than just you know, one piece here, one piece there. In fact, what needs to happen is in order to understand the model, you need to have a good understanding of how many infectious people there are, how many susceptible people there are, how often the infectious people actually turn up infecting the susceptible people, so the rate at which susceptible people become infectious, and the rate at which infectious people recover or develop immunity. You can imagine how this graphic, the previous graphic, would change over time. So I want you to think of this in terms of the things I'm going to talk about now, like testing, contact tracing, and therapeutics, and vaccines. Vaccines work to make more people immune by bypassing infection. They are a fast track to the ending state on the previous graph. There's also the possibility, you hear people talk about herd immunity, and um, that is actually a term that's associated with the vaccines to create a herd immunity. It's not actually used for natural infection going through a community. And I don't recommend that because in order to get there, we probably need a lot of people to die or become very, very sick. And that would create a lot of different problems than what we have right now, well, the same problems we're having right now, but even bigger. So I think we have to take the idea of removing people from the model by just getting them through the model, by getting them sicker faster, off the table. And I think until we have a vaccine, it's important to remember even when we do that a vaccine may not be 100% effective. And so some of the people who receive the vaccine will not actually be sort of shot put through the model over into immune. Some people will not be immune and it will, you will not know which individuals are not immune. We also don't know how long the vaccines are man will last and how long immunity lasts. And so there's a lot of confusion about that aspect of the model. Testing is another way. I mentioned earlier that removing people from the model doesn't happen only by them being immune. You can also physically remove them from the model by putting them into isolation or quarantine. And just to note, sick people go into isolation and exposed people who are still well are in quarantine. This is a, um, this is a terminology thing <laughs> that is one of my pet peeves. Anyway, um, if you find people who are sick and you remove them from the model by taking them out, then they can't have contact with the susceptible individuals, meaning that you have essentially removed them from the model to reduce the likelihood that there are contacts or reducing the rate at which susceptible people become infectious. So contact tracing and isolation is one way of getting people out of this model. Once they become infectious, reducing the number of people in the green box is one important way of reducing the spread of infection. Another way that we can do that is by quarantining, which is technically taking susceptible people that are very high risk of becoming infectious in the very near future and removing them from the model as well. That's quarantining. It says, I think these people are the highest risk of becoming infectious. I'm going to take them out of the model before they ever are. But there's another way that's really important. And that is acknowledging that we'll never ever get all of the people, we'll never be able to identify all the people who are infectious, which is a big problem. We can't test our way out of that. You never know exactly who's infectious. And you can't know exactly who is susceptible. And so reducing the likelihood that an infectious person will infect a susceptible person is another very good way of reducing the stress of this model on humanity. That means masks, distance, hand hygiene, staying home when you're sick, that sort of thing. 
So now you understand why everyone harps on these things and why they make things look better or not better based on whether or not they're done. But it's really important to remember that each of these things is imperfect in and of itself. Not everyone who gets sick will be immune. Not everyone who gets a vaccine will be immune. Not everyone who is infectious will be identified and taken out of the model. Not everyone who's high risk for becoming an infected person is going to be quarantined. Not every time that a mask is worn will it be successful. Not every ventilation system is going to be perfect. Not every your hands can't be perfectly clean all of the time. I know it's odd that I'm acknowledging that, but it's true. Your hands cannot be perfectly clean all of the time. And there are so many more. You may not know that you're sick to stay home. And so just staying home when you're sick doesn't actually work if people are asymptomatic. And so there are always going to be holes in every single step that we might put into place. But just like other safety interventions, if we layer them up, and we do all of them at the same time, we have the best chance of preventing any harm from happening in the model. In other words, trying to keep the number of people who are available, who die, so a proportion of those infected individuals will die, and we wanna keep that number low. We also wanna keep the number that are in the hospital low because that would be too much of a strain on our healthcare system. And so it is essential that we wear masks even though they're not perfect. It is essential that we wash our hands, even though our hands may not be clean all of the time. It is essential that we stay home when we are sick, even if we may end up coming to work with asymptomatic COVID. All of those things together help to make up for the imperfections of the other things. So what actually is going to protect you? The most important things are physical distancing, face masks, and eye protection. Those of you working in the hospital know this because we put it everywhere. And there is good data. This is a meta-analysis from the Lancet, which is a landmark study now for COVID, that shows that without an intervention, without using physical distancing, and they're only looking at three meters, not six, so that's, uh, or one meter, not two meters, that's three feet, not six feet. That means that there's less than one meter of social distancing, 12.8% of people would get infected. But if you had at least three feet of distancing, only 2.6% of the individuals who are exposed will get infected. That's a big difference. If you wear a face mask, if you don't have one on, that's not even including a respirator. This is any mask at all, all comers. 17.4% will get infected, whereas only 3.1% will be infected if the mask is worn by the individual who is protecting themselves. There's a whole nother issue with the source control aspect of masking, and that is very important. Independent of this study, there have been a number of other studies that have shown that even a two-ply uh, cotton mask that isn't super filtering is, can contain 95% of the particles of even a very contagious individual, including the aerosolized particles. And that means that everyone else is getting much less of an exposure. And that's really the main reason why people need to wear masks all the time. It is for source control more so than it is for protection. When you're caring for patients, it's for protection. When you are wearing it out and about, it's for source control. Eye protection is also really important. Without eye protection, 16% of people do get infected, but only 5% get infected when there is eye protection, which leads me to believe, and this is independent from the mask. Eye protection is very important. When there is no source control, distance, face mask, and eye protection is the way to go. And that leads me to say, whenever you're around someone who does not have a mask on, we need distance, masks, and eye protection. As healthcare workers, instead of distance, we cover you up with a gown and gloves, and we ask you to wash your hands, and we put a face mask and eye protection on. In real life, you can't like sort of, you could try and treat the train like in a contaminated environment and put on a sort of suit uh, while you're on the train and then dispose of it when you get off, but in reality, physical distancing is a little bit easier to practice. I want to make some notes about testing. So we have three different kinds of tests that are being used and they're kind of big categories. This is going to be important background understanding for you as you go forward in your daily lives and in this lecture series. PCR tests are the current gold standard, but they come in many different flavors. Nasal swabs are definitely the best. NP aspirates and mid-turbidate nasal swabs are very good. 
Oral swabs, not nearly as good. Saliva tests, the best we've seen is about 80% sensitive. So we need to consider that. That's why we don't offer saliva tests for you when you're sick or why we don't offer it for our patients. We need something better when someone is sick. These take a little bit longer than rapid tests, but as many of you know, some of the platforms turn around very quickly, including our Cepheid test, which can turn around in a couple of hours. Then we have the so-called rapid tests, which may take longer than the Cepheid test does, which is a PCR test. But just for um, argument's sake, let's put these rapid tests together. These rapid tests often detect antigen. They may be partnered with something that's sort of PCR-like. Um, they may use different wavelengths of light to try and um, identify particles that are associated with coronavirus. It's complicated. The point being that these are quick, often point of care tests. They are usually in this situation less sensitive, which is not um, what you would think of. So in many cases, we do rapid tests and they're more sensitive and then we have to confirm only the positives because we want to over select. For example, mammograms, we, they're a screening test. We want to catch anything that's abnormal, abnormal in a breast and then go on to have a more detailed examination using one of any number of more specific tests. However, when it comes to COVID, the best we can do right now are these less sensitive rapid tests. And that makes them not great at identifying who has COVID. Many of them are 60 to 70, maybe 80% effective at identifying who has COVID. These are the tests that were used in the White House in order to identify individuals as being COVID positive or negative before they met with the president or had uh, came to work that day. I think you're beginning to see how every single day in the White House was a big gamble. These tests are less sensitive, and if you wanted to actually have a confirmatory test, you'd want to confirm all the negatives, which is not really very reasonable. These tests are actually useful in um, sort of detecting clusters. If you test a lot of people and there's been a large scale cluster or super spreader event, you'll usually pick up some of the individuals, then you can figure out from them where they might have picked up COVID, and then you can go back and test all of the people that had that exposure using a PCR test. Unfortunately, that process often takes so long that it results in a lot of other people being infected. And so there are definitely pros and cons of each of these strategies. And when you start to look at different university testing platforms and university testing priorities, I have thought about this a lot. Um, you can see that there, there's no one standard way of doing things. There's no easy way to screen whole populations in short, uh, on a regular basis. Serology is useful for late complications like COVID toes or the uh, MISC in children. They won't still, many of them won't still have a positive COVID test or it's unreliable to expect them to have a positive PCR test. Um, but they do have uh, these positive serologies in that time frame. Now, what we are seeing is that antibodies do deteriorate over time or the antibody titers go down. It's not clear whether or not that has anything to do with immunity. And I'll get to that when I give you a little bit more information about immunity in general. I've misspelled immunity, I apologize. Therapeutics. There are four main therapeutics for COVID right now. Um, remdesivir you've heard of, it's a small molecule similar to other antiretroviral drugs. This is just one that helps bind to it and keeps it from replicating inside of cells. It um, was originally proposed as a drug for Ebola. It was then repurposed as a a drug for COVID, it's not awesome, but it's okay. Um, it helps reduce the length of stay. It's not pulling people back from the brink of death with a single dose, um, but it is certainly helping. Um, and it's now pretty widely available. Um, I'm sure that there will be shortages if there are issues, you know, if we do see the peaks that we expect to see over the winter. Dexamethasone, widely available, easily used for many other things. Um, a note, is that in SARS and MERS, steroids are thought to actually decrease or sort of increase the likelihood that a person will continue to carry the virus. They're not, it's not thought to, they've been proven, to increase the time to clearing viral peer clearance. They may make the course longer, but they may actually help people feel a little bit better in the beginning. There is some evidence of at least it improving mortality in these patients with COVID, and so it is used wisely, widely in people who are hypoxic, but because it does have this potential, it's never great to give steroids to people with infections, and so no one wants to give it to people who are getting over COVID on their own, period. Then we have convalescent plasma, which is sort of a blanket attempt at passive immunization, right? We're taking uh, 
antibodies from individuals who've had COVID, but it's all their antibodies. It's nothing specific. It's just the whole IVIG from the person that got over COVID. And we're just giving it to people that have COVID, hoping that there are some antibodies in there that will neutralize the virus and help tide the patient over till they can make their own immune response. That's been iffy. Sometimes it seems to help, sometimes it doesn't. These poly and monoclonal antibody cocktails, which are all still in phase three clinical trials, um, are not even available as an emergency use authorization, but are available for compassionate use. Apparently didn't know that until last week, but apparently they are because our president got some on compassionate use. Um, these are more specifically engineered antibodies. You can, they, you can imagine them as taking the the good antibodies from plasma, the ones that we think neutralize the, uh, the virus in different ways or prevent it from entering cells, and then creating lots and lots of them in the same way that they create Humira or Enbrel or any one of those drugs. They're all slightly different, and there are some that have multiple antibodies in them, some have only one monoclonal antibody, but the concept is the same. They are passive antibody, passive immunization, um, and they seem to last, their pharmacokinetics last about a month, which should be enough time for the person to develop their own immune response. We, we have trials of them here, and uh, from what my colleagues say, they're, they're doing very well. So that leads me to talk a bit about immunity and reinfection. So reinfection happens. We know it does. It's been proven, but it was really hard to prove. The way to prove that reinfections happen is you have to have a sequenced virus from the original infection and then a new clinical syndrome, a positive test, and a sequenced virus from that infection. In that case, we can see that someone has a different coronavirus or COVID. We've only had a few reported cases that are confirmed, but there are others that have been suspected in other patients. And those are all over the map, anywhere from 45 days to 150 days, 200 days after the original infection, maybe longer. We also know that patients who have COVID have a long tail or remote positive test after infection, but that we can't isolate transmissible virus after about eight days of the patient being sick. And so we aren't sure what this represents, probably just dead bits of RNA from the virus. But how important are they to whether or not the patient is going to get sick again, whether or not they keep making an immune response? It's not clear what we can do with those. There's a lot more to know about that particular situation. We know some antibodies are short-lived. In fact, what we consider to be the best neutralizing antibodies go away very quickly in individuals that have very, very mild infection. But there are also some stuff studies that suggest that there's longer term T cell related immunity in those individuals and maybe even in some individuals who've had other coronaviruses in the past that may make them susceptible. We are still learning a lot about this and many of the things that we tell people to do regarding uh, reinfection and long tail positives is extrapolated from data that's very minimal. And so clinical suspicion is still really important in that aspect of things, but there'll be a lot more to learn. And this is, as we get further and further away from people's infections, this is gonna become more and more important. I'd like to make a note on vaccines, which I think will feature prominently in the lectures this year. There are at least four vaccines currently available in phase three clinical trials. They have different mechanisms. One is an RNA virus, uh, a messenger RNA vaccine, which has never been successful before. That's the Moderna vaccine. There's an adenovirus vector vaccine. That's the AstraZeneca vaccine, which that trial was stopped briefly for um, neurologic side effects. It's been restarted in the UK, but not in some other countries. There are different protocols for these vaccines. And one of the pieces that it's important to remember from an ethics standpoint, as you think about vaccine trials, the safety of these vaccines are different than medications because they need to be given widely to a large population of healthy individuals. The standards for safety is always higher to something that's given widely to all individuals, whether or not they're sick, so to healthy individuals. However, in a situation where you have 200,000 Americans dead in just a few months, that safety it may not be as important to prevent a few cases of Guillain-Barre because pe if people get over those cases of Guillain-Barre and they're only going to be a few, if they're going to be 100,000, that's not great. If they're going to be five, that's probably okay because of the number of people we can save by using the vaccine. This is why there's an actual debate about whether or not we should cut trials shorter. I think that um, the 
current recommendations for at least two months of looking for um, the uh, for looking at side effects is reasonable as most side effects happen earlier than that with all the other vaccines that happened in the past. Um, the population or sample size is also important, and many of these trials have not um, enrolled to their um, appropriate or estimated size that they proposed. Um, and there are a lot of questions about this. I was pleased to see over the last 24 hours that the government, uh, the, the White House wanted uh, to overrule the FDA and the FDA said, nah, we're just not gonna submit any vaccines until we know for sure that everything's good. The timeline for this is uncertain, as you know, because of clinical enrollment and trials and clinically how patients are doing and how long it takes for them to develop immunity is different for different people. And so we can't set a timeline in advance. You have to see how the trial unfolds, which is kind of lost on some of our political friends. I also want to say a big shout out to our data safety monitoring board members across the world who are sitting on these trials. And um, they are the stop gaps right now, and they are the ones who will not let trials go forward. And many of them are ethicists like you all in the audience. And so thank you for sitting on DSMBs. I've sat on DSMBs before, and sometimes it's annoying because the, you feel like everything's completely fine and why do you have to do this? But the reality is that job is more important than ever. And this is a really good example of that. So please uh, be altruistic and uh, support being on DSMBs and being part of um, IRPs and things like that. And I think I've already mentioned plenty of politics about vaccines. Oh, a last piece. The distribution of vaccines is going to be the biggest issue of all. Um, many of these vaccines need minus 80 freezing and all sorts of other things. Um, and most people will need two doses, making the logistics of distribution um, really complicated. The last thing that I want to talk about today is a piece that I think actually describes why we're having so much trouble addressing and sort of accepting that what's been happening to us over the past um, six or seven months now in the United States and in the world. You know, it's normal as all of you, especially the fellows know, Elizabeth Kubler-Ross described the stages of grief uh, many years ago now, you see them here. These are commonly also applied to change. And this virus and this pandemic situation represents a serious loss for humans. Everyone has lost something. Some of us have lost loved ones. Some of us have lost patients. Many of us have lost out on opportunities, things we wanted to do, seeing family, being there for things we wanted to be there for. Many of us have losses. Even if you are living on an island alone, you still have lost out on things that you wanted to do. And that loss is hard for people. And everyone experiences loss differently, but we all go through these similar stages. Now, it's not that you first have denial, then it's followed by anger, then bargaining, then of course not. You bounce back and forth between these until you finally get to a place where acceptance is happening more frequently and more often than the denial, anger, bargaining, and depression. And one of the things that really matters here is our leadership and who helps you through your grief process. If you are in a grief process and someone you love has died and everyone around you tells you that you should just stay angry because it's not fair and the only thing you have, to, you, know, you know, if you just keep staying angry, you'll be better. You're probably likely to stay angry for a very long time and it will be harder for you to get to acceptance. It's important to experience the anger, the denial, the bargaining, and the depression, but it's just as important to recognize them for what they are and acknowledge that we need to get to acceptance. We've been missing that in our national discourse. There is not a clear message that it's normal to feel like you don't wanna pay attention to coronavirus anymore. I am sick to death of COVID. I don't wanna hear about it ever again. I could, I have, so tired of listening to contact tracing on TV. I am so tired of all of it. But the reality is that I can't, I can't just pretend it's not there. And I'm angry about a lot of things that have happened, but that doesn't mean and that I need to be angry forever. But if we tell people regularly, if leaders tell people that trust them and rely on them regularly, that denial and anger are the place to be, that bargaining about when we need to wear a mask, when we have to wear a mask. If we tell people that those are the only options, 
that that's the right answer to this catastrophe. They're likely to stay there for as long as they can. But if we help them see a way to get from their denial, their anger, their bargaining, and get them through the depression that is definitely part of all of this, we're more likely to get people to a place of acceptance where we can begin to incorporate the things that we need to do to live with COVID. Fighting against COVID, we will not win. But we can live with it if we continue to work together. There are lots of ethical questions along the way. Many of them stem from the facts and information that I've given you today. But I'm hoping that you can see a little bit more about how we got to where we are and about well, you can do at least as good a job as anybody in terms of crystal balling what's going to happen in the future. Bottom line is, we have a lot of knowledge now, but it's hard to accept that. It's hard to accept that everything has changed, but that's something that we need to do together. And I hope that through this lecture series that you all will get, become more familiar with how these things work in pandemics and how infectious diseases and uh, ethics come together in a way that is super interesting to me or I wouldn't be here today. So uh, that's, that is all I wanted to say today, except I do want to take a moment. I have talked to a ton of media and I have spoken out on COVID. I spend the majority of my day now giving talks about and talking about COVID. And I never have had the chance to say thank yous. So I do want to say thank you to all the people that have helped me um, and that have helped us as a hospital get through and get to where we are today. There are so many people that have been, everybody's been working on this and it's affected every single one of us. But um, there certainly are a lot of us who are still living um, literally COVID from dawn to past dusk every single day and have been since January. And I really appreciate all the support that it's given me to have all these people on my team. And I'm sure I've forgotten a lot of people, but I wanted to say thank you because without them, I could never do anything that I've done. We would never be where we are as an institution. And um, th these are the people that, that have really done a lot of work. Are there any questions? And I'll take away the slides now. I'll unshare my screen. Great, so Emily, this is Lainey Ross. I'm uh, helping uh, Mark with uh, following up on the chat line. So first, we want to say thank you to you for all you've done for all of us, as well as for opening this session with a fabulous talk. Okay. Yeah. The, the first question uh, comes from one of our attendees who said, you mentioned that many pregnant women will not get very sick from COVID. What's the impact of COVID on pregnant women when compared to the general population? And are they considered a high risk group? Early on in COVID, we found that um, pregnant women were much more likely to be positive than we thought they were. They didn't seem to be very sick. In New York, there was this study that said that 14% of asymptomatic pregnant women were positive for COVID. And most hospitals started, um, started uh, screening every woman that came in in labor um, in, when it came time to have their baby. And we found that a lot of them were positive. Now, certainly we know that COVID is common in pregnant women, but we haven't seen complications in that. So while they, um, that there are also, it's also true that we were missing a lot of asymptomatic cases in non-pregnant people. And so they're, uh, it's not clear that they are getting it any more frequently than anyone else is, but they definitely have less, um, sort of less complications than we think that they would, given that they are oftentimes a very high risk population. Now that said, um, I would, they have actually been downgraded in terms of their technical um, sort of how risky they are according to the CDC. They used to be in a tier one, they're down in tier two. There doesn't appear to be any effect on the fetus, um, even if you get COVID early on in pregnancy, but I think that everybody wants to see more data to know that for sure. And there's also, um, they, it appears to maybe be associated with preterm delivery, but um, not, not a ton of pre, not really, really little preemies, like maybe a couple weeks, like if you get it a couple weeks early, it's not, it's not too bad. That said, um, no one wants anyone to get COVID, even pregnant women. So, and we don't want their babies to get COVID. <laughs> but just because it's not so bad most of the time does not mean that we are going to just turn a blind eye. Thank you. The next question is, is it truly safe to be around people outside? Do you have any suggestions for being social in the winter time? 
Yeah, so outside, it's masks or distance, right? So if you're gonna be up close with people outside, you wanna wear a mask and they should wear a mask too. Inside, it's masks and distance. Now, that doesn't actually mean that you can't be near each other in a room. And, I, and this is something that I know <laughs> goes against a lot of what I'm saying. You need to have that much room for the people in the room because you need that volume of air to dissolve and, and dilute out their um, droplets. Now, I don't want you sitting up close with people when their masks are falling down under their nose or they're not like really doing the right thing or they're taking drinks from their water bottle. So you should in break rooms and work rooms stay far apart. But you know, if you're meeting up with friends and family, uh, friends that you wanna keep, that, are, that you're not ready, you don't want them to be part of your unmasked group, but you're going to meet up with them somewhere and sit and talk or play a game, you know, that would be a time to wear your mask. And you don't need to be too insistent about that six feet. Just make sure that there's enough space in the room for everybody's air to be diluted and keep as much space as you can. And then how do you keep safe? Um, that, that is my advice for how to keep safe in the winter. We're going to need to, you know, that SIR model is all driven by how many contacts there are between susceptibles and infected. And you can't tell who's infected. And so what you have to do is keep all, you, you, there are safe contacts and then they're unsafe. So safe contacts is when you're wearing a mask, you have plenty of room for the air, you're keeping some distance, you're outside, you know, that sort of thing. So it's gonna be not too many people at a time. If you're gonna be indoors, wearing your mask, playing, I don't know, a board game or something, um, but trying to avoid things where you're breathing heavily, no singing, which um, to those of you who know me know is very, very sad for me. I love to sing. Um, and so that, that's sort of the thing that you're gonna have to look for. Um, I guess we're all gonna be playing a lot of board games or watching Netflix. Thank you. Uh, but the next question is, in medicine, we talk a lot about professionalism and communicating truth. Yet in certain conditions such as COVID-19, a major part of information is conveyed through news by journalists. Can you say what is the moral responsibility of journalists in communicating in such conditions? Do they have any less or even more responsibility to communicate truthfully? I think they have, uh, they always have a responsibility to, to I, I mean, I'm not a, a journalism ethics person, but I think that they need to, I think that their goal and they should be always attempting to uh, present the truth. Unfortunately, I think that one thing, I, I've talked to a lot of journalists and I, I've I've realized, come to realize that they feel like, the, at least the ones that are writing about the science aspects of this, um, they want to get the message across. And they feel that the more, uh, that it, it, the end justifies the means a little bit in terms of their salacious headlines, that it, if, if it gets people to read it and then believe some of what's the truth, they don't want to lie, but they want to make it as click worthy as possible so that people will read the truth about it and feel, and, and maybe that will drown out some of the disinformation that is actively coming from other people. And don't, no doubt about it, there are some doctors out there with a lot of disinformation. And um, I, you can, anybody who wants to search for me on Twitter, see a few doctor Twitter trolls and a lot of other Twitter trolls. Um, and that will give you a very good idea about the disinformation that's going well, around. Uh, so on that note, um, how do you recommend that uh, we respond to uh, misinformation, conspiracies, and things of that sort? I think that this, this is that whole business about the Kubler-Ross stages of grief, right? These people are in denial. They're angry. They're bargaining with you about whether or not they need to wear masks in certain circumstances or whatever. Or it says that masks aren't perfect, so we shouldn't have to wear them at all. You know, this kind of thing. And that is, they are having, they're experiencing a loss and they can't figure out how to deal with it. I don't really respond to them. I don't think that shaming people or pushing people is really going to make a difference. There's some evidence that mask shaming people just makes them not want to wear a mask even more. They kind of dig their heels in. Um, so I try and be as friendly as possible and treat it kind of the same way that it, I tell people to treat hand hygiene. Oh, hey, I think you forgot to pull your mask up. Like not anything pushy or mean, but just, uh, I know I didn't want you to be unsafe or be on, you know, unlucky, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. And then just keep your distance, keep your distance from people who are behaving badly in public. But I think um, if people are behaving badly online, I, I don't know how to handle that other than to just ignore them. Um, we can't stop social media from being social media. And 
I think the best way, the best way of all, and this is like not a thing, I, I never thought I would be giving talks about this, but now I'm saying it in almost every talk. The best thing we can do to combat disinformation is to vote. Thank you. The, um, I have a, there's an economics question and basically like, how did we pick opening bars before we picked opening schools? Because no one was thinking. Um, because there's a lot of lobbyists for bars and restaurants and restaurant associations and because it was summertime. And that is true. We had to choose. We needed to make a societal decision about what was the best thing to open. And the problem is that there isn't a clear guidance from the, you know, all of that disinformation about it's perfectly safe to open schools with, with whatever is going on no matter what. That no, everybody knows that's not true. There are certainly things that have to happen in schools. We've got to mask kids. We need to do something about ventilation or at least thin out the classrooms. You can't put that many kids into, crowd them into a classroom. If you do, and we don't, we know that kids are getting COVID. They may not be dying of COVID, but they're going home to grandparents and they're seeing other individuals. And so we've got to, and there are teachers in those classrooms. So there, there needs to be safety parameters around school. But instead of putting out safety parameters around school, they just, said open school no matter what. And that resulted in a situation where nobody knew what to do. And I think um, bars are something where people are old enough to make a decision for their own safety and their own lives. And so people said, okay, fine. If people wanna go to bars, that's their own problem. And they didn't really think about, they just, there was no, no effort to consider the downstream effects of choosing one thing over another. And there was no acknowledgement that, it, that our contacts are a zero sum game. We can only have so many contacts with other people without having COVID spread so much. And if you are going to put kids in school, they're going to have contacts with other kids and with teachers. And if you're going to have that happen, you need to have a lower rate in your community. And the only way to get there is for everybody else not to have as many contacts. And so you cannot do both. It's, it is definitely a zero sum game when it comes to contacts. And that's the hardest thing for people to understand. They just see the gathering limits and they're like, oh, 10 people on Monday morning, 10 people on Monday night, 10 people on Tuesday night, and it's different people every time. And now all of a sudden you've got 30 contacts as opposed to you could have just worn masks or done something appropriate, played lawn games instead of had drinks outside and you would have been good. Although my whole lawn games promotional activity has not been taken off. I've been working on it since May. Um, I have a question about health care disparities, since we know that COVID has uh, disproportionately affected those of low income and minority folks. And the question is, how do you hope medicine and science will start addressing this fact when training physicians and uh, allied health professionals uh, in undergraduate years? I, I, think it's, I think it starts way before that. I think it's like, it's everything, our whole society has, I think what we've learned from the Black Lives Matter campaign, the COVID epidemic with disparities, and I've been doing a lot of reading about this, which obviously doesn't make me an expert, but still, I've, I have a much richer understanding than I did before, that we've been really messing this up as a country for a long time. And that, that has led to so many like tangled mess. I think of it as like, like the string that my child plays with, it just gets like in a complete mess. And it needs to be untangled in so many places. That is not, does not mean that we shouldn't do it in undergraduate education, graduate education, medical education, residency, training in every day. And I think we have to just start everywhere and start setting expectations and educate. I mean, we can't just educate, gotta educate, set expectations and start making changes. We all, and as, as physicians, I think there's a big role for us. I've always been impressed when I did my pediatrics rotation, how much of pediatrics, how much they pushed the importance of advocacy for children. And I think we all need to take that on and have advocacy for the underserved, period. Going back to your zero sum game, uh, one of the attendees asks, uh, how safe is it to go on a plane and would you fly on a plane? Well, I'm in a different situation than some of you. I have rheumatoid arthritis and take medicines that lower my, I'm on a TNF inhibitor and methotrexate. So my, my bar is a little lower than what some people, or bar is maybe higher, however you put it, um, for what I'm gonna do and take those risks. Now, that said, 
my mom has flown on a plane. Um, many of my friends have flown on planes. I think planes have the opportunity to be very safe or the opportunity to be really risky. And it is a bit of a gamble when you get onto a plane. Things that make a plane safer are when everybody is wearing masks. If you are going to fly on a plane, the safest way to fly on a plane is do not fly on a long haul flight if you can avoid it. The shorter the flight, the better. And that may mean taking stops on the way if you need to. That is one way you can interpret that advice. The other thing is to say that you need to wear the best mask you can. And that means um, if you're fitted to an N95 and you have one, you should wear that one then. Um, the other option would be a medical mask, or I've made a number of fabric masks. The people at Argonne did this awesome study and they found that 600 thread count cotton and silk, like natural silk, are really amazing. And they are as, they are as filtering as an N95. And so I've made these fabric masks that, are, that fit very nicely with a 600 thread count sheet on the, on the inside, and a silk in the middle, and then like a quilter and cotton on the outside. And they fit tight. And I feel confident in those and I would wear those on a plane. I sent one to my mom to wear on the plane when she was coming home from Florida after she got stuck there for months and months. And um, you've got to protect your eyes. So bring an eye shield. I think that's true of any public transportation. Just bring a face shield with you. And then if you're around people that don't have their masks on, put on your face shield. You need to wear it. Great. Um, another question is um, that facilities are beginning to bring back staff who were detailed to home back as part of the reopening plan. And the question is, what are your thoughts about clinicians who believe they should be allowed to stay home to continue virtual medicine versus bringing everyone back into face-to-face -face visits? I think there's a real benefit. Some patients need to be seen. I think that some patients need to be, have a person-to-person -person visit. Some things need to be done that way. Some things don't. I think this is very individualized. I think everybody has to think very... Uh, Unfortunately, I don't think most hospitals and, and medical centers or most, you know, anything are set up to be very granular about what really is essential in person and what's not essential in person. But as much as we can try and be personalized about that and individualized about who needs to be in person and who doesn't need to be in person, that's probably the best thing to do. Um, I think they're absolutely, it's safe to come to a hospital. It's safe to work in a hospital. Although I will tell you this, um, healthcare workers are not getting COVID from patients. They are getting COVID from each other. They are getting COVID in workrooms, in break rooms. They are seeing their colleagues as their quarantine family, and they are not distancing. And they are not being careful when they're eating. They are having their coffee at their workstation, and their workstation may be six feet apart in the stuffiest break room ever and they're taking their mask off and sitting there drinking their coffee, typing on the computer, happy as a clam that they're six feet from the person on the other side of the room who also has their mask off you know, typing and, and, and drinking. And so I think it's probably generally safe for most people to be in the workplace as long as the work spaces are not overcrowded. But if the workspace is overcrowded, it's dangerous. So I wanna ask one more question because I think we're going to 115. Uh, the last question I wanted was um, from Mark Lambert, especially since you opened with Beecham and Childress for principles, it seems that COVID has exposed the problem with the artificial boundaries between clinical ethics and public health ethics. Do you yes. think that's true? And can you speculate on how COVID will reshape these disciplinary boundaries? Yes, this is okay. So I did my ethics fellowship because I kept going to talk to Mark when I was began being the hospital epidemiologist. So I couldn't figure out how to how to apply medical ethics to things where everybody else is applying only public health ethics. And I didn't know how to balance them. No one knows how to balance them. You're right. That's what we're figuring out every day in infection control. We've, uh, this is what I talk about with the fellows when I give my talks with them. I talk about this all the time. They are completely different. They are, but it's, it's possible. You just have to think about balancing the risks and benefits differently and bringing in third parties when you need a third party to make a decision. If you are a stakeholder in the outcome, you probably need somebody else to be helping you to make that decision. In other words, right. as a provider, if you are going to be at risk by caring for the patient or you perceive yourself as being at risk, even if you're not, then you have a stake in the outcome and you probably need advice from somebody else about how to handle the situation. Um, you need to have shared decision-making that involves additional other people. That's the best advice I can give from a sort of, um, sort of a, 
pragmatic s standpoint, but I think that there's so much to learn about this and I don't have all the answers. There aren't a lot of people studying it and I'm too busy doing COVID to study that right now. <laughs> but I mean, that's like long-term, this is what I think is the most interesting. Like, are we, should we really be isolating these patients with MRSA? I mean, right now, actually no hospitals are. I've been arguing for that for a while and everybody abandoned their MRSA isolation in like the second week of COVID. Well, I want to thank you, Emily, and I'm going to pass this back to Mark. Laney, thank you. Um, before, I, before I thank Emily, I, I want to ask one question, if I might. And, and that is, early in your talk, uh, you mentioned something about vitamin D. Yeah. Being an important consideration. Could you just say a quick word about that? I don't have much more than that. There's this, there's, there's evidence. Some of it's from, I, uh, some of it's from a group here uh, at the University of Chicago. David Meltzer's team looked at this and they found that vitamin D levels were associated with, with poor, low vitamin D levels were associated with poorer outcomes. There's other data about that as well. And so if there's one thing that you want to add, if you want to add an additional layer to your layers of protection, um, you should carry a face shield with you and use it when people are not wearing their masks. That's number one. I'll say it one more time. Um, and then the other thing you should do is it's uh, once it gets to be winter time, it may be reasonable to supplement with vitamin D, but please be very careful that you follow instructions from a provider or what's on the label and don't overdo it. Vitamin D can cause problems. It's not one of those vitamins that you just pee out all the extra. So if you're gonna take vitamin D, you need to follow some instructions or some guidelines about it. Thank a you. Yeah. Th thank you. Um, I, I, I found the, the, the talk uh, an, an extraordinary opening talk of, of this 27 lecture series and um you, you you covered the topic so beautifully and gave us so much guidance and help um i i, I i'm saying for the group um who who attended how much how important it was and and how, how thankful we are for, for this great talk well thanks uh, for having me my pleasure Okay, thank you very much.